Good morning, everybody. Good to see you. Welcome back. For some of you, uh, you were a guest at Easter and you decided to come back a next, uh, a next week. Welcome back. Let's give our guests a great welcome, whether you're first time or coming back in a, for a fresh time. Um, hey, listen, we, uh, we, we need to do a little bit of a housekeeping moment. And the first, first step is to uh, invite everyone at all of our locations uh, to welcome our newest campus uh, to the family, our Groves campus. They launched on Easter, incredible Easter experience. Let's welcome Groves, everybody. And let's welcome all our church family, Nacogdoches, Dieball, Duncan, Iglesia, Online, Mount Enterprise, incredible stuff. Now we need to have a, a kind of a Timber Creek culture housekeeping moment. So I want to invite everybody in the house, all of our locations to stand with me. Stand where you are, stay, stand where you are, stay where you are. We're dismissing already? Oh, heck no. No, we got a lot to do. We got a lot to do. But listen, you, you reproduce what you reiterate, okay? Uh, you deserve what you tolerate. You keep what you celebrate. And it's important for Timber Creek Church to do those things, reproduce what we reiterate, to make sure that we're not tolerating things because we deserve that. If we talk, like we got to have the things right and crystal clear and where we're headed, mission, vision, values. And then also we keep what we celebrate. It is important to celebrate when God is on the move. He is always moving, always working. It's not that, that he's not working. It's just sometimes we don't see it. Easter weekend is a great opportunity for us just to take a moment, push pause, and see what God has done and what he's doing. It is not the finish line, it is the starting line. And Easter's just beginning for a whole lot of people because they're experiencing that resurrection experience in their own hearts. And so just for a moment, I wanna celebrate some statistics with you about our Easter weekend. And so uh, get ready, because like this is like celebrating means like we go woo woo, like, like we, we party you know a little bit. The world parties to forget stuff. We party to remember stuff. And so we're gonna party, okay? So we got set up party atmosphere. Are you ready? Are you ready? You don't sound ready, Lufkin. Are you ready, Knack? Are you ready? Oh, ready, Groves? Okay, all right. Okay, there you go. Okay, okay, I see you, I see you. All right, here we go. We're gonna celebrate some Easter stats. First of all, the dream teams is not about being a part of an elite group. It's about God's dream for people. And being a part of the dream team, we had 515 people serving across our campuses. Whoa, thank you, dream teamers. I mean, from driving uh, golf carts to opening doors to taking care of your brats and kids. I mean, it was amazing. I'm kidding. We love, we love your kids, even the brats, uh, which are mine, which are mine, okay? Hey, we, we want to celebrate that uh, in our attendance across our locations, we saw 6,384 people on our campuses. Wow. Side note, do you know that when they launched this church 97 years ago in Lufkin, Texas. The population of Lufkin was 7,000 people. Could you, could you think them meeting in a living room saying someday we could reach this whole city and them going, no, nah, pastor, that's a, little, that's a little crazy. And yet we almost reached what they were, a size of that city when the, when the church was birthed. How cool is that? Hey, but I really want to celebrate the survey. We do this every Christmas, every Easter. It's a one question and it, you mark A, B, C, or D. Number one, we doubled our survey response this, this year from last year. Thank you for being obedient to that. Thank you for helping. Even though you've like done it seven times, keep doing it. It helps people around you. Uh, these meant, if you checked A, you're already following Jesus. You're on the right track. B was saying, hey, I need, to, I need to be saved. I need Jesus to be the middle center of my life on the throne of my heart. C, still considering. I need to dip my toes in the water a little bit more. And D, no thanks. I wanna give you the results of these and then we're gonna pray. First, for the no thanks, there were 11 people. You know what that says to me? It says that some people, whether they were not interested or not, you're still inviting people to church. Keep on inviting, people will still keep coming. <laughs> Number two, they're still considering 50 people. Like this is a church anyone can come to, community destination where you can find and follow Jesus. And so we're thankful for those that want to take a journey. And if that's you and you're back here today, you're on the right track. You're on the right track. Uh, Thousands of people were following and checked A, but I really want to celebrate now. Are you ready to put your celebration in like high gear and fifth, fifth, you know, gear and overdrive here? People that marked, I need to start or restart a relationship with Jesus Christ. 596 people. 
Wow. Wow. Prayer is paramount. Prayer isn't our last resort, it's our first response. I wanna pray over the, those that answered this survey. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you for those that are saying even like, no thanks. God, if you are who you say you are, meet them where they are. For those that are still considering, Lord, would you show your kindness to them one day at a time as they journey, just like Nicodemus, just like the disciples that had to figure this out. They had to consider these things. May this be the kind of place and us be the kind of people that can welcome questions and give clarity and have a safe place to find and follow you. Lord, we thank you for all the faithful people. May they, may they re-up in their surrender and obedience to you. But Lord, we now say thank you for names that are written in the Lamb's Book of Life those that are on their way to heaven. Lord, it's the beginning. There's a lot of people that will say, Lord, Lord, and not enter the kingdom of heaven. But God, I pray that this would be a serious moment where they have said, Lord, it's not about you on my terms. It's about you and you alone. And I wanna serve you and follow you and take next steps to become more like you. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would guide them and teach them and that we would help them on that journey. We ask it in Jesus' name. And everybody at every location said a good amen. amen. Well, listen, while you're standing, uh, we are starting a parenting series. I can tell you that this whole five-week journey is gonna be one big message, and it starts today. Parenting is one long conversation. Parenting is one long conversation, and it doesn't stop at three or 16 or 18 or 24. It's, a, it's one long conversation, and we're, in the next five weeks, are gonna have one long conversation about parenting and it's not about how you're parenting it's how you're thinking about your parenting and it's about your thinking to kick it off today um, we want to start by putting the oxygen mask on us before we can put the oxygen mask on anybody else and I want to welcome uh, a good friend of mine who pastors an incredible church, founded a church several years ago uh, in, the, in, in DFW, uh, Cross Timbers Church, and now is thousands of people on multiple locations. My friend uh, and his wife, Toby and Micah, uh, planted that church. Then they transitioned to become the founding pastors and started the ministry they're in now that is resourcing parents uh, with Christian uh, resources for mental health and dealing with that crisis that is upon us uh, globally, in particular in the United States. And so while you're standing at all locations, will you help me welcome our speaker for today, Toby Slough. Love you. Love you, brother. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's so, uh, for me personally, gratifying to be in this area of the country this weekend. I grew up in South Texas. So I feel like this is kind of my region a little bit. I grew up in a little town called Angleton, Texas, which is about 15 minutes off the coast uh, outside of Houston. Uh, and so I'm, when I talk about my story, I know that you guys understand it, wherever you are, Whatever campus you find yourself today, you understand our part of the country. I've been in uh, 24 states in the last 14 months, and I go to the upper Midwest, and they don't get the fact that, number one, uh, I am the child of public educators. My dad was in public education for 42 years. My mom, 37. My dad was a coach, and people always ask me, what kind of coach? Well, we're in Texas, man. He coached football and then something else, right? That's what we do in Texas. So he's a basketball coach, but he coached football. My mom was an elementary school math teacher, fifth grade math teacher, gave me my first B, still mad about it, and uh, was a librarian. That's a long way of saying, I grew up in a little town, we didn't have very much. We didn't have very much money, but it's okay, because nobody had money, we didn't know any different. And my parents made the summer so special for my family, all being off on a budget. Like we went in the summer 30 times to the Astrodome to watch the Astros play. Not because I'm an Astros fan, go Texas Rangers uh, world champs, <laughs> but because it costs a dollar to sit in the outfield bleachers and 50 cents to park. And so for less than $5, because we took peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and a jug of water, and if it was a good day, we had lemonade, uh, 
And for 450, you had three hours of entertainment. I watched those guys lose 30 times a summer when I was a kid. <laughs> the other thing we did is we went to the beach. We went to the beach like most people in the country go to the park. My Aunt Blanche had a beach house. Look at me, everybody. Beach house. Don't think HGTV, think Hut TV. I mean, you know, a couple of blocks off the beach, but it was free. And we would go spend days there. And I will never forget when I was seven. When I was seven years old, we had been at Aunt Blanche's beach house and we came back to the house. We're eating dinner, whatever we were eating, and the phone rang. Now, next generation people look at me. In those days, our phones plugged into the wall. I know it's hard for you to understand and I know what you're thinking. What did you do if you weren't home? We didn't answer it, it was awesome. And my mom was kind of bougie, so we had an avocado phone plugged into the wall. The phone rang, she answered it, and I heard her say, oh no, and she started crying. And my father went over to talk to her, and I saw a tear in his eye, which was very unusual. And I said, what happened? And they told me that we had had a friend die of drowning at Surfside Beach that day, one of our friends. In fact, in my growing up year seven in a circle of either our city or that area that we knew, drowned at Surfside Beach. And I said, Dad, what was he doing? Well, he was surf fishing. I said, well, how do you drown surf fishing? You're in water, you know, to your knees. And everybody, look up here. You need to hear this. That was the day that my dad taught me about the undertow. An unseen force that is pulling you in a direction you would never want to go. And unless you learn the right way to fight it, it will take you under. Now this is the 60s and so my dad parented like he coached and it went like this. Son, look at me. This is why we're always careful at the beach. Now go to bed. That is like 710, I went to bed. Any of you an overthinker, any of our campuses, any of you overthinkers? Two hands if you're charismatic overthinker. How many of you? <laughs> We're all over, right? Uh, those of you who didn't raise your hand because you're thinking about whether you're an overthinker, you are one. <laughs> I have always been an overthinker and here was the thought I had. I wonder what it feels like to drown. Does it hurt? or you just go to sleep. How long would it take for them to find my body? I started thinking about my funeral, who would come? I started getting mad at people that weren't coming to my imaginary funeral. <laughs> now the Bible says that as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. I wasn't living, I wasn't, I didn't understand it, but I was living it, right? The, the poster in my cafeteria was wrong. You aren't what you eat, you are what you think. And some of you are here today just for this. If you consider a negative possibility long enough, you will convince yourself in your heart it is a reality. TikTok is killing some of you. The national news is killing some of you. Be very careful about what you set your mind upon. And I went to bed at seven years old, tears running down my face, praying this prayer, oh God, please don't let me drown. I had no idea that would be my prayer that I would pray the most for the next 53 years of my life. God, please don't let me drown. Oh, I'm, I'm not worried about drowning in coastal water. I haven't been in past my ankles since that day ever. And those of you who go, oh, I can fix you, build a bridge, get over it. I ain't doing it. I'm just very rational. It's very real to me. No, I'm talking about, and some of you know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the black wave of anxiety or depression that comes out of nowhere. 
And I don't know about you, but I feel like I'm drowning. My name is Toby. I'm 60 years old. I love Jesus with all my heart. I really do. I'm not just saying it because I'm staying at a church on Sunday. My wife, her name is Micah. We've been married for 39 years next month. Uh, we, we try to make decisions in our life through the filter of faith, which is really hard to do. To pause and say, God, what would you have us do? How would, would you have us spend our money? Where would we put our energy? That's hard. It sounds easy on Sunday. It's just not. We don't get it right all the time, but we, we try. I believe every word of God's word is true. Even the parts I don't like or understand. Come on, lamentations. I mean, who knows, right? My feet do not hit the floor in the morning ever without me praying, asking God to fill me with his Holy Spirit. I am aware of my inadequacy and my insufficiency. And I know that I leak and I need to be filled again. And for now, almost 30 years, I have lived with a diagnosed anxiety and panic disorder that God hasn't healed me from and church people don't know what to do with me because I don't fit in the pray it away box. So I've spent 28 years of my life enrolled in a university that nobody wants to go to school at. I don't, I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, but I want you to look at me. I know what I'm talking about with this one because I've lived it. I know what it's like to be hurt by church people. I know what it's like to lay in bed in the middle of the night asking God, how long, oh Lord? I know what it's like to be filled with shame. I know what it's like to pray for years for something and not hear anything. And I know now what Jesus really offered me. See, I thought what Jesus offered me was healing. And we, by his stripes, we are healed. But not everybody gets healed every time, do they? No, what Jesus offers is better than healing. He offered freedom. See, freedom is not the absence of anxiety. It's the presence and power of God in the middle of anxiety. And nothing in my life changed until my target changed. It's not that I don't want God to take it away. I just don't need him to, to believe that he's real. Because I experience his power in the moments when I am most aware that I need him the most. So I'm this, what can the devil do to me, guy? He tried it all, and I'm still running with Jesus. I'm still, I mean, I'm journey, man. I have not stopped believing that he who began a good work in me is going to carry it on to completion. And I've learned that the battle that I thought I was having is not really the battle at all. See, I thought my battle was with anxiety and depression, but my battle is not simply that. It is a battle between letting what I know control what I feel instead of letting what I feel in the moment control what I know. You with me? The Bible says that you will know the truth and the truth will set you. Everybody knows that, right? But do you know that a lie believed has the same power to put you in captivity that the truth does to set you free? And living in a culture that says subliminally this to all of us, if it feels that way, it must be true. Like how many of us, how many of you have ever been, you've been in such a challenging situation relationally, emotionally, financially, physically, 
that you felt like your prayers weren't getting past the ceiling? How many of you? Raise two hands if you're charismatic. How many of you? Right? I get that. I've been there, but here's the thing. God's not past the ceiling. The message of the kingdom is that the kingdom of God is within your reach. He's near. He's here. Like somebody that told you if God is far away, guess who moves? They lied to you. If you move, God moves with you. He is pursuing you. Not when you get where you ought to be, but where you are, because this side of heaven, you're never going to be everything you ought to be. Yeah, but pastor doesn't feel that way. The greatest challenge to the young people of today is the subliminal message that if it feels that way, it must be true. If you feel like a cat, you're a cat. Just identify as a cat. There's a Bible word for that. You know what it is? Stupid. It's just, it's, I mean, I don't want to offend anybody, but it's, 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 can I say that here? I did, so God bless you. <laughs> and you're, when, when you're battling for your mental health, you're so vulnerable to your feelings. Right? So if you look to your left and your right, wherever you're sitting, like we are not a statistical anomaly here. Two out of three of people in this room and in our rooms around East Texas are battling anxiety, depression, are generally feeling overwhelmed by life at some level. Two out of three. So for those of you who aren't battling, can I say this? God bless you. And I mean it. I couldn't say it with integrity 10 years ago. But the way you were knit together in your mother's womb and your life experience and the way your body chemistry works, that's just never been a thing for you. God bless you. But I'm, I assume you want to help people like me. Do you? Can I say something in love to you? You're not helping most of the time. Your emails don't help me. They make me feel more ashamed. I don't need your podcast or your herbs. Like, I'm okay with where God has me. I need you to help me. I'm gonna show you today how you help me because I want you to help people you love. You with me? And then for those of you who are battling, don't listen. I want you to listen to what I say, but just look, I'm 60. I've been married almost, you know, almost 40 years, five grandkids, three of which I like at the same time. Uh, <laughs> I love my life. I'm a happy person and I have anxiety and pain disorder. You can too. You can love your life. But here's some truths that you have to do some business yourself with and start believing are true even when they feel like they're not. Number one, you have to believe, because I think one of the biggest lies you believe is, well, there's something wrong with God. This is what I hear from the people who deconstruct their faith. The Bible doesn't work for me. Well, which part of the Bible doesn't work for you? Well, the part of the Bible where God fixes everything and God hasn't fixed this. This is what I, I mean, I've had, I've had online debates, we'll use that word, with people who say, well, if God is real, then why does fill in the blank happen? Well, you're assuming that if God is real, it's gonna go the way you, got, you want it to go. Somebody's here today to hear this. There is a God and you ain't him. He's smarter than you. His ways aren't your ways. You don't want a God that you can figure out. That's not a big enough God for you. And if you really read the Bible, you'll find out that your concept of God making everything fair and right. Dude, the fair left town last week. You going to heaven ain't fair one day, right? If that's your, then I would encourage you to, to go read about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Daniel chapter one who stood up for the Lord and said, we don't care what you do to us, we're not bowing our knee. You go read the story, and they were sentenced to death by fire. 
And then the Bible says the next morning. I wonder what happened from the sentence to the next morning. The boys are in captivity. They're building the largest pizza oven known to mankind. They're gonna throw them in there. The boys are not saying, it's gonna be great. We're gonna be in the Bible someday. That's not what they're saying. They're begging God to do something. Are they not? Where did they meet Jesus? Oh, he was in the fire, not taking them around the fire? Daniel in the next chapter is more afraid of not praying than he is of a hungry lion. Where does God do his greatest work? In the pit, not around the pit. We just celebrated over the last couple of weeks the last days of Jesus' life as he, sat, as he was in the Garden of Gethsemane saying these words, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. You're telling me that anxiety or depression is a sign of a lack of faith? Go tell Jesus that. His soul was overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. He says to his three closest friends, come keep watch with me. Is this not crazy that the one who created it all when the chips were down needed his friends? Men, how in the world do we think we can do it by ourselves? See him on the cross saying, my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? Now, I know what some of you of my generation are thinking. We were all taught the same thing. Well, sin was on him. God turned his face. That's not in the Bible. That's a hymn we sang. That's Jesus being so overwhelmed with physical, emotional pain that he thinks God has left him. And see the cross as the reason we can celebrate today. Like there is nothing wrong with God, he's at work. I have staked my life on this truth. We know that in all things. You know why Paul had to say all things? Because all things aren't good. All things, God is at work for good. For those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Like, I don't know you, but I do know that the Lord is at work in your life. You have to decide, is he a good dad or not? Does he want what's best for me or not? And deciding that in the middle of anxiety or depression is like going to the store hungry. You'll lose the battle. You with me? Nothing wrong with God. Number two. This is the big one. Let's, so I'll put it in the middle. Well, there's there, nothing wrong with God, but there's something wrong with me. Obviously, I'm not spiritual enough. I'm not holy enough. I sinned too much. Because we would never answer this in a Sunday school or Bible bowl quiz, but in our subconscious, we believe that God rewards people who perform well and God punishes those who don't perform well. Do you know how many hundreds of people around the country have come to me and said, well, I know God is just punishing me because I did this. If you know Jesus, you are unpunishable. Every sin you have ever committed, past, present, or future, was paid for at the cross of Jesus Christ. Dude, that's Old Testament, Old Covenant. New Covenant, he does not treat you as your sins deserve. Thank you, Jesus. How many of you guys have a life verse? How many of you have a life verse, like a verse you go to every time when life's tough? How many of you in here have one? Raise your hand. I can see you at all the campuses. That's a lie, I can't, but tell me anyway. How many of you, go raise your hand if you have one, because I'm just gonna keep asking. Make it up, make me feel better about myself. There you go. So I have people call out their life verses when I'm in smaller rooms. Now remember, I have been in 24 states in the last 14 months. I've been in Democratic churches, Republican churches, white churches, black churches, rich churches, poor churches. I've been in every kind of church out there, and the answers are all the same. It comes down to three Verses that I have gotten overwhelmingly from people, their life verse. One is, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Number two, I am more than a conqueror through him who loves me. And number one, nothing can separate me from the love of Christ. Those are great life verses to stake your life on. But look at me, everybody. Here's the problem. You don't get to pick your life verse. Your life verse picks you. You don't get to pick it. Your life verse picks you. God knit you together in your mother's womb. You have unique challenges, unique strengths, unique weaknesses. 
And there is a word in the living word of God that is like your compass north when you find your whole world disoriented. You wanna know what mine is? Say yeah, because I'm gonna tell you. It'll go faster for you. Mine comes in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. My hero in the Bible, obviously outside of Jesus, is Paul. Paul wrote three-fourths of the New Testament. We are sitting here today because of Paul. If he wouldn't have been so stinking stubborn and cared so little about what everybody else thought, we would be the outsiders. We're not Jewish. <laughs> Y'all do know that going to all the world to make disciples, that that was that command, that's who we are. We were the outsiders. Paul's it for me. And Paul, who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, says in 2 Corinthians 12, he says, to keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Well, I have time to get into this today, but the Bible says God opposes the proud. That's a military term. He lines up against the proud. So if you think God is lucky to have you on your team, you better buckle your seatbelt. You think anything good in your life is because of you. You better buckle your seatbelt. God will show you. Humble yourself or he will humble you. I promise you. I promise you. And Paul said, I got this gift. It was a gift to be able to see into the third heaven. It's really deep. Pastor Jeremy's gonna explain it all to you next week. <clears throat> but he said, I got this. He called it a thorn in the flesh. We don't know what the thorn was. I think, God did it on purpose so we would see ourselves in this story. I believe his thorn in the flesh was mental illness, was anxiety, depression, because that's my battle. Why do you believe that? Well, because I feel tormented sometimes, quite honestly. And he says, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. Now, we don't know if this is literal. There, the Bible, many times, the biblical writers use multiples to let you know it wasn't just a one-time deal. So the guy who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, who planted all of these churches, said, God, here's one thing I want. Take away this thorn in the flesh. And he replied to me, no. My grace is sufficient. My power is made perfect in weakness. Anybody want and he said no on a coffee cup or a t-shirt is your motto for life. But God said it was the lowlights, not the highlights that were gonna draw people to him. This is, this is free, this is extra, but Jesus is on the road to Emmaus post-Easter, post you remember? And the guys don't know who he is, the two he's walking with, he, they don't know who he is. And they, he goes to have dinner with them and it says Jesus broke the bread and their eyes were open. Well, we know that in Jewish community, what you did was you took the loaf, you lifted to heaven, you prayed, then you broke it and handed it. When Jesus lifted his hands, it was the scars that opened their eyes to who he really was. Your scars are what draw people to Jesus. That's what God's telling Paul here. Paul says, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. In a culture that says, hide your weaknesses at all costs, Paul says, no, my goal is to walk out the door today and for you to believe God must be awesome because that dude is whacked out. Because Paul understood, this is so important, that his battle was not his identity. We have everybody around us telling us who we are and what makes us matter. I wanna tell you something, moms and dads, grandparents, look at me. You need to be at this workshop tonight. Drive in from your campus, Nacogdoches. Drive in, Grove. I mean, come here, be a part of this. Why? Because your kids don't need a sermon. They need a strategy. They need a strategy. I promise if you come, here's my money back guarantee, which is really cool because it's free for y'all. But here's the guarantee. I'm going to give you practical tools 
that if you will use them five minutes a day, five days a week with your kids, I promise you in one month, you will see progress in their mental health. I promise. It probably won't be as far as you want it to go and it won't go as easy as you want it to go. But I promise you, you'll see progress. We've done this all over the country. If you keep doing it the way you've been doing it, do not be surprised if you keep getting what you've been getting. Well, well I'll tell you, I'll answer you. I had a provost of the university. Have these tools been tested? Yes, sir. How long? 30 years. Where? In my life. In the life of my kids and my grandkids. I want to help you. I can help you. But I need you to be here tonight. And the first thing I'm going to teach you is a lesson I learned over 20 years ago. I called a friend of mine who was a pastor in another state. I said, I'm struggling. I'm in this loop. How do you get out of it? You do know that if your mate or your kids are, they're overthinking something, the dumbest thing you can tell them is don't think about it. Because if they could not think about it, they would. It is to tell them, it's to give them some way to redirect their thoughts to something else, right? If you're on a diet and the goal of your diet is to not eat chocolate cake, in a week, your face will be in a chocolate cake. You have to replace it. Y'all with me? So I called this friend. I said, I need something. He said, go Google the 40 I am's. I'd never heard of the 40 I am's. The 40 I am's are 40 statements from the Bible about who God says that you are. He said, write them on index cards and go say them out loud. And within three minutes of hanging up that phone, I was at CVS at, right behind my house. I had cards. I wrote every one out by hand. And I was sitting 30 minutes later at my picnic table in my backyard, picking them up and saying them out loud. I, need, I thought that was weird, but you know, I didn't understand at that point. Your faith is verbal. Everybody, Jesus on a storm tossed sea did not go. He didn't do the genie thing. What do you do? Peace be still, because your words have power to create reality. So I picked the ones that were hardest for me to believe. That's not hypocrisy, that's faith. And just start throwing them down on the table and declaring who God says that I am because it doesn't feel like I am. And I want to tell you something. That was over 17, 20 years ago. I won't tell you. I told you 24 states. I won't tell you the countries, the places I've been. I have never been anywhere without those cards. These are them. I will never graduate from these. I'll never. These are my number one weapon in my battle for my mental health. Because look at me, I'm not anxiety and panic. I am a child of the king who is overcoming daily in the power of Jesus. How do you know that's true about me? Because God said it. And the only one who gets to define you is the one that created you. Nobody else gets to define you. Only God. And I'm telling you something, moms and dads. Somebody's telling your kids who they are and what makes them matter. Your job as a parent and a grandparent is to be speaking identity and life into your kids. There's nothing wrong with you. Some of you are depressed because life is depressing. Some of you are anxious because there are things in life that make you anxious. Faith in Jesus doesn't make you Superman or Superwoman. That is impervious that, but you have a power beyond yourself. Look, man, I love the fact I am an overcomer. I just don't like overcoming stuff. True? Your child is a child of the king. They have access to more things than they think they have. I grew up in the don't be a baby generation. I'll just stick that bone back in. You'll be fine. Don't be a baby. It was, that was damaging, wasn't it? Let me tell you about some of you. This is what you're telling your kids. Oh, you're not saying don't be a baby because your parents did that to you and it makes you mad. No, what you're telling them is, oh, you poor baby. Oh, you poor baby. It's hard. We have the least resilient generation in the history of America because you can't be resilient without resistance and we're removing the resistance from our kids' lives. My dad told me it wasn't hard. Some of you are telling your kids it's too hard. What we need to tell our kids is you can do hard things because God is with you. That's who you are. 
And I'm going to teach you tonight how to do it. But you're going to have to look in the mirror yourself regularly and remind yourself that you are who God says that you are. Thirdly, finally, quickly, I have always believed as a linear thinker, I've always believed that positive progress is God's plan for my life. I've always thought that my life, it's up and to the right. And so when I go back a couple steps, my first thought is what did I do wrong? How is God trying to get my attention? Anybody else like that? Can we just know what I do wrong? Right? Like God calls you to something and then you build a plan and then the plan doesn't go the way you want it to go and so you throw the whole thing out and you forget it was your plan and it was God's call, right? So when I, I was first diagnosed 30 years ago with anxiety and panic disorder, what happened was is I was, I was pastoring a church, the church had exploded in growth, not cross timbers when I was at before we had built a building. I had two, I had an uh, eight-year-old and a six-year-old. They were doing awesome. This woman, I mean, look at her and look at me. I mean, one good woman made one bad decision. I've been set for all of my life. <laughs> She's the best thing that's ever happened to me. Nothing in my life around me is happening. I have a disorder. People go, what do you have to be anxious about? Nothing, I make things up. But that night I sit up in bed. She's dead asleep. She's in full rim before her head is compressed in the pillow. I hate that about her. I sit up in the bed, I'm breathing hard, my hands are shaking, and I'm sweating. And I look at you sweet girls right here. You, know, you go, oh, he had a panic attack, right? I didn't never heard the word panic attack. I'd never heard the word depression 30 years ago. I didn't know anybody who'd seen a counselor. The only word I'd heard is nervous breakdown which they put you in, little guys in the white suits come in, put you in a truck and take you off. That's what I thought. So, but I'm a guy, I do what guys do. I get up and start walking the hall of the house. I'm just walking off. I walk, for, literally, I walk for two hours. I'd get tired, I'd lay down on the sunken step of my sunken living room, hit a eight track. I'll tell you about eight tracks later, but I hit the eight track. <laughs> I had Phillips, Craig and Dean, Mercy came running. I would beg God to do something. I wouldn't hear anything and the wave would come back. I would get up and walk. Well, what did Micah think? Well, I didn't tell her what, she, I didn't tell her. Didn't I tell you already? I'm an overthinker. When I walked, number one, I, I thought of two things when I walked. What sin did I not, did I forget to ask God to forgive me of that he's punishing me for? And two, if I'm going crazy, she's gonna leave me. The church is gonna fire me. Did I mention if you consider a negative possibility? So I'm hiding it for 17 days, every night, lost 21 pounds. People would walk up to me and say, Pastor, you look great, are you working out? I couldn't tell them the truth, I'm throwing up. On day 18, I made a decision. The world would be better off without me. I got in my truck, driving down 30, I-35 towards Fort Worth to ram my truck into a bridge abutment. It's the only way I could end my life and nobody would know I did it on purpose. I know what it's like to believe that the world will be better off without you. And I feel it was the Lord who gave me a picture in that moment of my wife telling my little girl that daddy wasn't coming home and I swerved at the last moment. And it scared me. And it led me to doing the thing I didn't want to do the most, which is that's where freedom happens. You hear me? I told the one I love the most the truth, and we went and got me some help. I'll tell you more about that story tonight. And I started this journey that I've been on. In the early days, I told Micah, I know how God's going to work this. I'm going to write a book, travel the country, travel the world, and tell people how you overcome anxiety what it looks like to be healed. And on my bad days, I told her, I'm going to sell used cars because it's the only thing I could think of that I could do and because the church deserves somebody stronger than me. 
And on the 20-year birthday of Cross Timbers, which was birthed out of that pain of me desperate to build a place where it would be the first place people would wanna go when they're struggling, not the last. On our 20-year birthday, our team said, you need to write a book. And I just said, I'm not writing a book. Who wants to write about trying to kill themselves and how much the church hurt them? Who wants to put that on paper? I mean, if, seriously. But Micah said, I think you ought to write a book. And brother, look at me. Like, if you get somebody like this, she tells you what to do, just say yes. The book, the only hard part was my publisher said the last chapter has to be good. And how, you, how many of you know when, when the pressure's on, sometimes you freeze. So I have a really great assistant. Her name is Google. And I went to Google and I put, what's an animal that, that, that fights against stuff? Actually, I put in, what's another fish like a salmon? Because I thought about them fighting upstream. And I learned about the goby fish found only in Hawaii, off the big island, that comes from the ocean where it's born. And when the tide is right, swims up mountain streams. And when it gets to the waterfall, check this out, everybody. His bottom jaw starts growing out. God grows his jaw out. The Bible says, the heavens declare the glory of God. If you want to know how the kingdom of God that you can't see works, look at creation. God grew his jaw. Why? So he could grab the rocks and use his mouth and go from rock to rock and live the rest of his life in the pools at the top of the mountains off the big island. And I cried because that's me. The very thing I had been running from was the thing God was using to shape my life. So we released the book, and in the last week of the series, I decided I wanted to tell the story of the fish. So I went to YouTube, found a seven-minute video, got six uh, legal pads, sat at uh, my, the bar at my, in my kitchen, not a bar, that's another message, I sat at the bar, and I just turned the YouTube on and off until I taught myself to draw a fish. And I called my creative team and said, I'm gonna tell the story of a goby fish. What are you going to call it? Well, my name is Toby, the fish is a goby. It sounds like Jesus to me. They said, you can't draw a fish. I said, oh yeah, I learned on YouTube today. And I sent them this picture. And that was the picture that I sent them. And I kid you not, two days later, two days, Jeremy, I stood up and I told the story of this little fish and the lessons he learned that were this. You can do hard things because God is with you. Two, you have to keep your eyes on the sun. And three, you have to help others along the way. COVID hit two months later. My daughter-in-law, who is a graphic, very gifted graphic artist, her dream had been to do a kid's book. I had a kid's story. We wrote the book and released it and it exploded all over this country. Look at me, this wasn't my plan. It wasn't my plan. We released this book in Spanish in Costa Rica last year. We're working on it in Hindi and we're going to release it in India. We're going to release it in seven dialects of Farsi in the Middle East because they've asked us to do it. I've spoken live to over 100,000 people engaged online with 2.1 million people over the past 14 months, this little book sat at the top of Amazon's bestseller list for, Christian, for, non, for children's nonfiction for like three weeks, and none of it was my plan. His ways are not my ways. He doesn't do stuff the way I would do it. And I got this picture, unsolicited, by the way, this picture of this little boy who is seven years old whose name is Gideon, who a bird or something hit his window at night, convinced him that somebody was trying to get him. He went like two weeks without being able to sleep, which how many of you mamas know how big a deal that is for the mom, for the kid? And his mom let him pick five of the 40 I am's that we rewrote for kids. He picked them and put them by his bed. So at night, his words, he would know God was with him. He could sleep and have a good day the next day. That is my oldest grandson, Gideon. 53 years after that seven-year-old boy said, please God, don't let me drown. God had been working in the heavenlies. Like that is my legacy. I don't, the rest is all just 
like I would do it a hundred times over to give him something I never had. Look at me, you have a legacy. You may not have even met him yet. Why should you keep going, fighting, believing? Because it's not about you. I know that's not popular to say, but it's not. God wants to use you in the life of somebody else. And if you are still breathing, God ain't done. I know it's hard. I know you feel embarrassed at best, ashamed at worst. But God is with you. And the secret is to keep swimming. You keep going. You keep believing. Become annoyingly optimistic. Can I pray for you? Hey, hey, look at me, everybody. Thanks. I love you. Thank you. For the honor of being on this journey with you. Let's pray. God, I'm struggling a little bit today. Who else is with me? Who's, who's battling a little bit? Just raise your hand. Don't be embarrassed. Holy Spirit, would you send help to hurting people today? Would you bring strength that we don't feel like we have? Would you be manna today? Be enough for today for us. Thank you, Lord. And I pray that in East Texas that your kingdom would expand as we connect people to your power in the middle of this journey. And I'm grateful that even though I don't see it or feel it, you're working in our lives. Not just one voice together, Dad, just say, Thine is the kingdom, God, the power and the glory. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen and amen.